Hi, I'm your host, Greg. And I'm your host, Vanessa. Thank you for tuning into Serial Killers. We're overwhelmed with the support we've received from our listeners in the first few weeks and cannot thank you enough for listening, subscribing, and writing such nice reviews. You've probably noticed some ads on our episodes. Each episode of Serial Killers costs thousands of dollars to produce. Ads help keep serial killers free for everyone, but we don't want to just promote any old product. We want to share products and subscriptions that you, our listeners, are truly interested in, in hopes of enhancing your experience. To do that, we need to get to know you better. So please, go to podsurvey.com slash serial. After you complete the survey, you can enter to win a $100 Amazon card. It's quick, easy, and anonymous. Though if you want us to get to know you not so anonymously, feel free to reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or podcast.com. We love hearing from listeners. And even if you've taken a podcast listener survey before, this survey is specific to serial killers. So we really need you to take it too. Again, that's podsurvey.com slash S-E-R-I-A-L. Fill out the survey and enter to win a gift card. Thanks for your help. Before we begin today's episode, I want to warn you, that we will be discussing graphic, disturbing topics. We would never wish to glorify or minimize the damage this killer has caused to countless families. Listener discretion is highly advised. You don't earn the nickname, the Vampire of Dusseldorf or the Dusseldorf Monster by leaving a neat crime scene behind. In Peter Curtin's own words, quote, I used to stroll at night through the Hof Garden very often, and in the spring of 1930, I noticed a swan sleeping at the edge of the lake. I cut its throat. The blood spurted up, and I drank from the stump and ejaculated. End quote. Peter Curtin learned from an early age that the sight and sound of blood would arouse him sexually often giving him an orgasm in the midst of his murders. Welcome to Serial Killers, where we take a look into the minds of the most notorious serial killers around the globe. I'm Greg Polson, and I'll be your host during this investigation. Today, we conclude our psychological profile of Peter Curtin, a sadist who became known as the Vampire of Dusseldorf. If you want to listen to any episodes of Serial Killers, you can find them all in your favorite podcast directory. Don't forget to subscribe. You can also listen on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. A new episode comes out every Monday. Visit our Facebook page, Parcast, to join the conversation. Last week, we delved into Peter Curtin's Dickensian childhood where he suffered from constant physical and psychological abuse. He started his life of crime before he was 10 and did his utmost to hurt as many people as he could. But before we dive back into the gritty underbelly of Jazz Age Dusseldorf, let's bring back Vanessa. Vanessa will be answering questions I have about the mental makeup of a serial killer, what makes them tick, what molded them, and what their thought process is like, as well as providing other valuable insight. It's important to note that she's not a psychologist or psychiatrist, but like me, she's fascinated by the psychology of serial killers and has done a lot of research for the show. Thanks, Greg. Last week, we dipped our toes into the McDonald triad, a set of personality disorders that act as an unofficial warning sign for children at risk for violent tendencies. Curtin's fascination with fire is well documented, but he also exhibited one of the most common warning signs for psychopathy, extreme cruelty to animals. I want to disclaim again that this is a sensitive topic and could be upsetting to some of our listeners. When Curtin was nine years old, he had endured almost an entire decade's worth of abuse. He befriended a dog catcher in 1902. It was far from wholesome. His new friend often tortured and killed the dogs he caught, and he brought Curtin in on the endeavor. Curtin would stay in this pet mutilation ring for years, but as he approached puberty, sexual violence became his driving urge. Curtin soon added bestiality to his list of perversions and regularly raped pigs, goats, and sheep. 
Bestiality is the term for a sexual act between humans and animals. Bestiality, or the larger term, zoophilia, is considered a paraphilia. A paraphilia, in simpler terms, is just an unusual fetish or sexual predilection. In no way are we here to shame anyone, but a fetish for feet or specific role plays are infinitely more common than the desire to molest a goat. What are the chances Curtin had an actual sexual attraction to farm animals? It's much more likely that the rape fulfilled his underlying sadism. It wasn't about sex, it was about power. As a quick refresher, sadism is a personality disorder in which an individual gets an emotional thrill hurting or humiliating someone else. It's a sliding scale from enjoys knocking over an opponent's chess piece to likes to stab them in non-fatal areas to hear them scream. Not all killers are sadists, and not all sadists are killers, obviously, but there is an undeniable overlap. Cruelty to animals and bedwetting into adolescence round out the homicidal triad. So why is animal cruelty given the most attention in the triad? Well, Alan Brantley, a special agent in the FBI, characterized animal cruelty as a warm-up to killing humans. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? And how do you successfully murder over 10 people without being caught? Hmm, practice, practice, practice. Yep, you start small to graduate to your main goal. Hurting something smaller and weaker than you is a way to pour out your frustrations while making you feel in control. Convicted killers who exhibited the McDonald triad most often had incredibly abusive, destructive childhoods. Violence in your formative years begets violence, and children are the lowest end of the totem pole. They aren't big enough to fight back yet, or emotionally developed enough for positive coping mechanisms. They feel no other way to let their emotions out, and so they resort to violence, yeah. which they've been taught is an acceptable outlet. When there's nowhere to hide in your own house, or your personal freedoms are restricted as heavily as most abused children's are, you will do anything to feel powerful. Curtin ran away from home constantly as a child, but always ended up returning. His father, as we mentioned last week, would eventually be imprisoned for raping his eldest daughter. But Curtin had been inside the house for too long to escape the negative formation. In a study titled, Animal Cruelty and Violent Behavior, Is There a Connection? 45 violent inmates were interviewed. 56% of them admitted to harming animals in their childhood or teens. These men were also heavily abused as children. Randall Lockwood, Ph.D., corroborated this theory by saying, quote, Animal cruelty can be part of a continuing cycle of violence within the family. Children whose animals were abused as a way of intimidating them, they became animal abusers themselves. They grow up to be child abusers or other violent criminals, end quote. Just raping the animals soon wasn't enough for Curtin. Curtin graduated to cutting and stabbing the animals while he raped them, enjoying the blood. It was the blood that would drive him to an orgasm every time. Curtin is foremost known in history as a murderer, but we should never discount the number of rapes he committed during his reign in Germany. After moving his wife, Augusta, back to Dusseldorf, he enlisted two maids to care for their house, named Tida and Mech. Augusta discovered he had been having sex with both women and threw a fit. But Mech and Tita both soon sought out the Dusseldorf police. Mech explicitly told them she'd been raped. Mech's claims would ultimately go unheeded, but Tita accused Curtin of the obscure crime of seduction. Seduction is just as archaic as it sounds. It was once illegal to lure innocent young maidens into your bed without marrying them. That charge would stick, and Curtin would be jailed briefly. Most of his rapes came right before the killing blow. Rosa Oliger, the young girl Curtin killed in 1929 and set on fire after death, was molested post-mortem, with Curtin leaving behind biological evidence. It seems so needlessly evil, but hypersexuality is a common coping mechanism for childhood sexual abuse survivors, according to the Childhood Trauma Recovery Center. Remember, this was a little boy who was forced to watch his insanely abusive father have sex with his mother alongside his 12 siblings. His father raped his own daughter, 
These were not healthy sexual examples for a child at their most vulnerable. We covered sexual sadism in last week's episode, but I also would like to address the topic of grooming. Child grooming is the process in which an adult or older peer establishes a friendly or emotional connection with a child for the purposes of abuse. The goal is sexual abuse. An adult befriends a child and through constant exposure desensitizes them to sex or teaches them that kindness is rewarded by certain favors. You trust your cool, older friend who swears they would never hurt you. Both his father and the dog catcher groomed Curtin in their own way. His father's sexual violence helped instill a similar need in Curtin. His father held all the power in the household. He called the shots, and he kept the rest of them subdued by pain and fear. He trained Peter through constant repetition that the way to feel powerful is to hurt and rape the people around you. The dog catcher did not physically abuse Curtin, but he taught him perhaps the most dangerous lesson of his life. You can hurt something smaller and weaker, and it will feel good. It's a common argument when a violent tragedy happens. When a child is immersed in violence, they themselves will become violent. It is used most often when a group wants to ban a movie or video game. But according to Child Trends Research Center, there is more than a kernel of truth in response to real-life violence. Abused children are at a higher risk for attachment and aggression disorders, but growing up in a high-stress environment also affects a developing psyche. Out-of-whack hormones affecting your brain chemistry can cause lasting damage. Violence begets violence, and studies have shown a definitive pattern. Abused children are more likely to abuse other people in a continuous loop of aggression. To most of us, it's an absolutely disgusting thing to fathom. But look at it through the lens of little Peter Curtin, who has never been quite right. It's likely Curtin already had these latent urges bubbling under his skin. He often lashed out violently, hurting people around him. Remember that when he was nine, he claims to have drowned two classmates for fun. A young child with simmering resentment and no impulse control is taken under the wing of a sociopath. He's given an outlet and training and easy access to the victims, the stray dogs of Dusseldorf. Even when he was incarcerated, they never kept him long. His longest stint was eight years for arson and army desertion. In 1905, he estimated to police he had set 24 fires by New Year's. Curtin got a sexual thrill from fire, but he also fantasized about the local homeless population burning to death. Horrifying. Whew, I think we need a break. I think so too. I want to tell you about our sponsor, Blue Apron. For less than $10 a meal, Blue Apron delivers easy-to-follow seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients right to your door. Oh yes, not to mention, Blue Apron has partnered with over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the U.S. to ensure that all their ingredients are of the highest quality. And the food is incredible. The recipes combine unique and fun flavors. For example, I recently made a pork dish with a fig and blood orange sauce. I'm no chef, I would never have thought of combining those flavors, but they combine so well. Mmm, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Some of the meals available in March include salmon piccata with orzo and broccoli, pork chops and miso butter with bok choy and marinated apple, vegetable chili and baked sweet potatoes with crispy tortilla strips, and spicy shrimp coconut curry with cabbage and rice. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash killers. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash killers. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Mm, okay, let's get back to the ingredients that make a serial killer. Fire, animal abuse, incontinence. The McDonald Triad is a handy way to check for any warning signs in a disturbed child. But Curtin also exhibited the warning signs of another famous list, the Dark Triad. It sounds ominous, but the Dark Triad is just a psychological study that focuses on the big three personality traits for criminals. Psychopathy, 
narcissism, and Machiavellianism. Obviously, not all criminals are on the dark triad spectrum. But individuals possessing the triad are statistically more likely to commit a crime or abuse a position of power. Curtin was undoubtedly a psychopath, but narcissism and Machiavellianism may be a harder sell until you break them down to their core elements. Narcissism fundamentally boils down to egotism, pride, and a pathological lack of empathy. Machiavellianism is a willingness to take advantage of other people and a knack for deception. People tend to focus more on the bestiality and blood drinking, but Curtin very clearly had no problem with deceiving his wife, and no one would ever accuse the man of having human empathy. Psychopathy tends to be the linchpin of the debate of suggestion. Can a disturbed individual be born or made? Well, the dark triad has been shown to have clear genetic components. Psychopathy is a born condition, unless the individual suffered massive brain trauma. An abusive childhood certainly doesn't help, but personality disorders do not often start from nothing. Curtin was most likely genetically predisposed to some of his illnesses, and filled in the rest of the gaps with poor coping mechanisms. The dark triad has a catchy ring to it, but there's been a push within the last few decades to add sadism to the list, bringing about a dark tetrad. Curtin would exhibit many qualities in a dark tetrad, chief among them impulsivity and hair-trigger violence. As his kill spree went on, Curtin began trying to outsmart the police. Up until that point, he had never been a suspect. He was in and out of jail for numerous offenses, but had not been brought in even on suspicion in the murders. After the murders of sisters Louisa Lenson and Gertrude Hamaker, he stabbed 27-year-old Gertrude Schultz in the head and neck. She survived the attack ultimately, but the knife was put away in favor of a blunter instrument. Beginning September 1929, Curtin would use a hammer as his weapon of choice. Curtin raped a house servant named Ida Router in a secluded area by the Rhine River, and then viciously beat her to death with his hammer. He left her beside the river. Just 11 days later, Curtin encountered another servant named Elizabeth Dorier outside of a busy theater. He asked her on a date and she accepted. They walked along the bank of the Kleine Dussel River. He hit her on the side of the head with a hammer and raped her when she was on the ground. After he finished up, he beat Elizabeth in the head with the hammer repeatedly, again leaving her by the riverbank where she passed. A few days later, he would hammer two more people, though they would both survive their injuries. There simply isn't as much evidence to paint Curtin as strongly a narcissist as he was a psychopath. But his last confirmed kill would show a side of him he kept hidden from the police. I'd like to extend our final content warning. He strangled five-year-old Gertrude Alberman and then stabbed her 35 times, riddling her head and chest with scissor wounds. All of his murders were cruel, but an argument could be made for excessive cruelty here. Two days after murdering the little girl, he sent a crude map to a newspaper detailing exactly where he left the body. Curtin joined the angry mob that formed when the police uncovered Gertrude's body. He joined them in their outrage. This is a hallmark of the big three we've been discussing, narcissism, psychopathy, and sadism. Getting credit for his work was not a consistent part of Curtin's M.O. He eavesdropped after his first kill, the little girl in the tavern, Christine Klein, but went underground for the bulk of his spree. It was once he became paranoid about being caught that he began to up his ante. The abrupt about-face could suggest a form of immersion therapy. Immersion therapy is surrounding yourself with something you fear the most to lessen its effect on you. I would get a pet tarantula and hold it every day if I were arachnophobic, for example. Right. Of course, that's only one way to look at it. The most likely scenario was looking to take credit for his work. The fear of capture by his wife or the police was outweighed by his desire to see just what a good job he had done at hiding in plain sight. Towards the end of his life, Curtin began acting in opposition to his previous behavior. 
The hard-hearted man who regularly raped and abused women seemed to have fallen in actual love with his wife, Augusta. Or if not love, affection and companionship. Curtin's arrogance caught up with him. The police compared the map containing the coordinates to Gertrude's body and the letter confessing Maria Hahn's murder and realized it was the same penmanship. By 1930, there was a substantial reward for any leads on the vampire of Dusseldorf. Curtin confessed everything to Augusta. They'd been married for seven years. Curtin had successfully killed 11 people in that time and raped and attacked scores more. The man who was so terrified that his wife would discover a secret that he buried a body in the cornfield actually encouraged the woman to turn him in and collect the reward money. Because she was no fool, Augusta did. Curtin waited outside the St. Roche's church in Dusseldorf as his wife promised the police. The man admitted to every charge brought against him and admitted to dozens of murders and attempted murders the police didn't even know about. Curtin would tell the police he could have a spontaneous orgasm after his murder, but he also let slip a twisted little facet of his personality we would have never known otherwise. If he had an orgasm while strangling, not stabbing, he would apologize to the woman he was in the process of killing. Why? Quote Peter Curtin, that's what love is all about. Unquote. Curtin was groomed to equate sex with violence, power with fear. Love is seen as a basic human emotion, but many wires can be crossed in the process of learning it. We can surmise he felt something for Augusta. He respected her enough to care for her well-being with the cash reward, and valued her as human enough not to stab her to death with scissors. We've seen throughout psychological studies that children exposed to sexual abuse develop non-traditional views on the act. Curtin seemed at war with his own internal dichotomy. He raped and tortured, but did not want to disrespect his strangling victims. Ultimately, Peter Curtin was severely unwell. No matter how lucid he appeared, his mind was not in a healthy space. Unwell people may certainly contradict themselves. Or the apologies could have stemmed from disappointment. Blood was his favorite thing, and seeing it drip out of a person was his grand finale. Fire made him excited, too. It was destruction that he was after, and having his body betray him before he could get to the gore could have broken the mood when it happened. If his sexual haze was broken just for a moment, the reality of what he was doing might have set in. No matter his reasoning for his odd moral hardline, Curtin would not renounce his murders. He stood trial in Dusseldorf, sitting in a crude cage to prevent families of his victims from killing him before the sentencing. Several psychiatrists were brought in to determine his mental state. Each of them determined he was legally sane he meticulously planned each murder. He also remembered even the smallest details from the crime scene. Someone in a rash haze would not be able to reminisce fondly over the 30 plus people they've tried to kill. Halfway through the trial, Curtin had had enough. Curtin pled guilty and it fell onto the jury to decide what would come of him. They deliberated for two hours. He was sentenced to death for each charge of murder, nine total. On the morning of July 2nd, 1931, Curtin was walked to the guillotine in Cologne, Germany's Klingelpultz prison. He was asked if he had any last words. No, that's a straight quote. He went to the guillotine and didn't bother to prepare any last words. Once his head left his neck, doctors tried desperately to understand how a man like Peter Curtin could exist. They dissected his head, looking for any visible abnormalities in his brain that could point to his cruelty. At the time, psychopathy and brain damage were not common knowledge. Nothing looked amiss. They eventually mummified his skull for display. It was purchased by Ripley's Believe It or Not.
For 14 years, the vampire of Dusseldorf carved a path of fire and fear through his little quadrant of Germany. Beginning at only nine years old, Peter Curtin lived a life of impulsive action with destructive consequences. To quote Curtin, when my desire for injuring people awoke, the love of setting fire to things awoke as well. The sight of the flames excited me, but above all, it was the excitement of the attempts to extinguish the fire and the agitation of those who saw their property being destroyed. Curtin relished in chaos and the thrill of the kill. After a hellish childhood, he exhibited signs of both the McDonald Triad and the Dark Triad. The nature versus nurture argument may never be definitively resolved, but one thing is certain, Curtin wrought havoc and pain wherever he went. He attacked with no discretion or mercy, and was shown no mercy when he was finally brought to an end. Thank you for listening to Serial Killers. Be sure to join us next Monday as we start our psychological profile investigation of the Canon Barbie killers. If you enjoyed this episode, please tell your friends. Don't forget to subscribe to Serial Killers on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or any other podcast directory. Or through our website, parcast.com. That's P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. A new episode of Serial Killers comes out every Monday. Please let us know what you think and join the conversation on our Parcast Facebook page. You can tweet us at Parcast Network. That's P-A-R-C-A-S-T Network. Have a killer week. Serial Killers was created by Max Cutler and developed by Ron Cutler. It is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It's produced by Max and Ron Cutler. Sound design by Ron Shapiro, with production assistance by Joel Stein and Maggie Admeyer. Serial Killers is written by Samantha Gubrash and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. If you're trying to decide what to listen to next, let me recommend Parcast's other podcast, Unsolved Murders, True Crime Stories. If you like serial killers or like true crime podcasts, movies, and TV shows, I believe you'll enjoy this podcast. With the help of an ensemble cast of voice actors, follow hosts Carter and Wendy as they take you on an entertaining journey through real crime scenes and attempt to solve the case. Listen now on your favorite podcast directory or by visiting parcast.com slash unsolved. That's spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com slash unsolved. <laughs>